My name is Janice Hoke and I'm a member of the Nevada Women's History Project. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2021. And we are interviewing Dawn Gibbons, who was Nevada's first lady between the years of 2007 and 2011. Welcome, Dawn. Oh, thank you. It's so nice to be here. Please tell us about your early life. Oh, well, Janice, my early life uh, was very difficult, okay? My mom, uh, she left uh, my dad and uh, went off with uh, the church leader. Uh, he was a minister, and uh, I didn't see her for many years. In the interim, my dad, um, he became an alcoholic, and he grieved every night about my mom. It, it was very difficult. He was in the newspaper business. He worked for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And uh, so there were times when I had to pick him up and take him to a place to get help. I took him to AA, but nothing really worked. When I was 16 years old, I had my first date. And so uh, we went to the movie, and then we went to this little place where everybody, you know, smooches. And uh, I felt this feeling that I needed to be back home. And, the, and so I went back and said, we, look, I got to go home. He says, well, you, got, you, you can stay till 10 o'clock. Your dad said that. And I said, no, I want to go home. So when I went home, I saw my dad with a gun. At my new stepmom, who was a very nice person, she was on the phone with his parents in Florida. And uh, I got, went right in front of her and told my boyfriend, please call the cops. So I stood in front of her and he kept saying, move. I wouldn't move. And uh, he got up and he went to the restroom and came out and he shot right past me. I still didn't move. The doorbell rang and he said, well, who's that? And I said, dad, it's the cops. So he um, came out and went and, and bought some, you know, got some clothes on because he didn't have his, all his boxer shorts and a, a t-shirt. And the cops said, look, I want your stepmom to go outside. You should go outside while I talk to your dad. I said, okay. So my dad comes and talk, they talk to the police. And Atlanta Journal had the police department on, uh, right by them. And so <clears throat> my dad knew a lot of the uh, cops. So the policeman comes back out and he says, I don't think your stepmom should come in, but you can come in. And he said, your dad put a gun under the sofa. So while I'm talking to your dad at the front door, I want you to get the gun and put it outside in the back. I said, okay. And he said, does he have any more other guns? I said, yeah, he's got all kind of guns, you know. Um, he says, where are they? I said, they're in a closet, you know. And he says, well, get those and put them outside. So I come in, I'm looking under the sofa, there's no gun. So I go to uh, the other uh, room, you know, the uh, sitting area, and I look under there and there's no gun. So I have to go by the closet with all the guns and rifles and all that, and I start taking them and put, putting them outside. And I'm thinking, my dad's gotta be hearing this. He's gonna kill me for doing this. So after I got all those out, I came back and I looked under the sofa again, and the cop was here, my dad was there, and um, there was no gun. My dad, shot toward my stepmother. Fortunately, he didn't hit her. And then he shot three times. And I saw him fall back and just his legs. And so uh, the cop didn't shoot my dad because he was afraid I would run out. So that night I spent all night long at a friend's house calling uh, the hospital, Grady Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you remember that from being in Georgia. And uh, he was, you know, on life support. So the next day, uh, I, had, I went over to uh, Grady and I tried to get hold of the doctor and he was asleep because he'd stayed up all night with my dad. 
And um, so I came home and my dad's brains were on the floor. My grandmother and grandfather, his parents were coming in. I didn't want my grandmother to see it, so I took paper towels, I put the brain <laughs> into the bag, and uh, it was a garbage bag. <clears throat> and then I did as much as I could to clean up, and then I went back to Grady Hospital where I spoke with the doctor. And so the doctor said, your stepmother will make no decisions in this matter, but your dad's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. I'm like, What's, what do you mean a vegetable? I, he said, well, he doesn't have a brain. I pick up the garbage bag with my dad's brains. And I said, well, here's his brains. And he says, oh, I don't think you quite understand. Your dad's never going to be able to talk. He's not going to ever walk you down the aisle. He'll just be like a vegetable laying down there. And uh, you have to make the decision. And he's a young man, so uh, I think we, we might not be able to get his kidneys or uh, liver, but he has other things that we can use, his, and he said particularly the eyes and uh, a lot of other things. <clears throat> and so I said, okay, my dad has beautiful green eyes, and uh, I'll go ahead and sign. <clears throat> And I went and said goodbye to my dad, and I, I knew he was just never going to be himself again. So when I'm telling you this, everything that's happened to me that's been bad has been on the front page of the newspaper. When my mother left, it was a big scandal, front page of the newspaper, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. When my dad died, same thing, front page, <coughs> suicide. And then um, when my husband decided to leave me, uh, that was on the front page of the paper, plus uh, it was in the paper a lot. <laughs> so I think what happened with me is I took the thing with my dad with the organ donation, and when I became a, legislature, a legislator, uh, I worked on organ donations and trying to get help for people. A lot of people uh, wouldn't put themselves on um, the driver's license. And a lot of Hispanic people uh, kind of had a problem with it, you know, Catholic. So we worked really hard and <clears throat> Frankie Sue Del Papa, uh, who was the AG then, she was a very good friend of mine. and. Uh, we put together uh, this organ donor uh, plan, and now it's at the University of Nevada Medical School. So we're, we're still ongoing, uh, and uh, she and I are always trying to save lives. Uh, we had a young lady just recently, and um, she was 16 years old, and she needed a liver. And when you're in northern Nevada, you're tied to, um, Northern California, so that includes, you know, big cities, and, and so when our people get sick, they go down, and San Francisco goes up. When you're in Southern Nevada, it's the same thing. Even though we have, you know, 2.3 million people in Southern Nevada, uh, there's much more people in Los Angeles in that area, so we're last to get an organ. So something good came out of something, something really bad. Something, yes, and, and so I feel like that was a way of honoring my father. That's why I've also been involved <clears throat> in uh, um, alcoholism, trying to help people like that, and uh, people that are on drugs, because my dad was also on drugs. So let's go back to your, the beginning of all this. Um, tell me about your life after that, your schooling, your professional life. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I was 16 when my dad died, so I had to graduate. Uh, the 11th, I grad, skipped the 11th grade because I needed a job. I needed to take care of myself. <clears throat> so I worked as a uh, shampoo girl. Uh, when I got out of uh, school, and then I graduated uh, early. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, after that, um, things got better in my life. 
uh, I reconnected with my mom and came to Nevada and uh, I um, worked and uh, I actually ended up uh, having five very successful businesses. Back uh, in those old days, uh, it was in the 70s, uh, I um, just got very interested. I, I was a photographer, and I'm sure the photographer appreciates this, <laughs> but um, I was a florist, and uh, I also um, assisted people in getting married, and, and the people that were Hispanic, I learned to do everything to kind of get them through the whole system. And um, I will say one day after I was married to Jim Gibbons and I had bought all these businesses in the meantime, um, I told him to come down on February 14th. It was uh, just uh, a, less than a year after we got married. And I said, you got to come down here because there's so many people that got married today, and we're at 299. I get down here so we can be the 300. <laughs> we did 300 weddings in one day in wow. 1987 on Valentine's Day. That's amazing. What a great experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell me um, about uh, the legislature. You called um, in for your husband. Right? Okay. When I served in uh, for my husband when during Gulf War, and he went over, uh, I'll, and, well, and tell us a little bit about his being called up. And yes, he was a pilot. He was a pilot, and uh, I was so mad that he was going there because I had a three-year-old son, Jimmy, and uh, I didn't hardly speak to him before he left, <laughs> but um, he he did, and um, it was Operation. Uh, let's see, they changed it, Desert. Desert Storm, to Operation Desert Shield to Operation Desert Storm. So he, you know, was in his second uh, legislative session and he had left a note for me. So one morning he calls me and he says, uh, I need you to go to the safe and get this note and uh, take it to the governor's office. And I said, okay. And uh, I was kind of upset. And so I, uh, I called like a couple of my friends, Lisa, uh, who was, um, she was uh, an anchor, and, <laughs> and I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was telling her everything, and so when I went to the governor's office about three o'clock, because I was kind of crying and upset, uh, the governor took the letter and opened it up, and it said, uh, it looks like I'm not going to make it home. Would you, uh, you worked really hard to, you know, during the election, and would you take my place? And so, my, oh my God, I hated the legislature because I was a business person and they were always doing something to me. <laughs> so uh, they went through us uh, and uh, appointed me the county commissioner. And Governor Miller at the time said, heck yeah, I want her in the legislature. Uh -huh. She'll be good. And so <laughs> I went to the legislature and it was a very difficult time, you know, because uh, everybody was sad because of the war. And uh, I remember one of my colleagues said, why, why do you keep your husband's name, you know, James Gibbons, uh, assemblyman, uh, on your door and everything? I said, well, I'm, I'm hoping he's coming back. And he did, and it was, uh, I remember it was around uh, IRS time. <laughs> we have to pay your taxes. And so um, the legislature only pays you for a certain amount, like a couple of months. I'd gotten all the money. <laughs> so there was nothing left for him to get. But um, so um, I went back to my business working, and uh, my mom had helped me you know, take care of my son during that time because it, it, was, it was busy. The legislature was very busy. And then um, I got sick, uh, very sick with my feet and um, almost died. <clears throat> so for quite a few years there, I had a problem walking and going, just even going grocery shopping. And Harry Reid, found me this attorney, uh, this doctor that was so fabulous. And he says, I'm gonna send you to this doctor, Don. We have got to get you well. 
So I went to the doctor, uh, and um, he, he was a very famous doctor. I mean, I wouldn't have gotten in if it wasn't for Senator Harry Reid. And so uh, they operated on me and, and got me well. And when I came back, Brian Sandoval was being re he was the assemblyman, he was being reappointed to the gaming uh, control board or commission. Yes. And uh, I just knew I was supposed to be a legislator. So uh, I, I filed <laughs> and uh, worked very hard. And I actually won in the primary because I won more than the 50% uh, vote. And um, I, I was there for a mission. I, I didn't really feel like I wanted to stay there forever because I'm basically a business person. But I, I did accomplish a lot of things with the help of Frankie Sue, with organ donors. We did autism uh, later on uh, when I was first lady. We um, did, uh, oh, uh, the Crystal Darkness campaign during that time. And so whatever I did in the legislature when I became first lady, I, I did a lot more. <laughs> because Frank, uh, uh, Sandy Miller, she and her husband, Governor Miller, had come into the, leg uh, to the mansion with us the first day. And she looked at me and she said, Don, you've been a business person and you've been a legislator. She said, you can do a lot in this position. Okay. <laughs> and I just took that for the gospel truth because I knew I could get things done in the legislature. Barbara Buckley, she, it's so funny, that first year, she didn't put anything for Jim <laughs> when he was the governor, but she put in all this stuff for me to do, and she uh, gave more money to, for me to be able to fly back and forth to Vegas, and because she believed in me, and, and she told me this, she said, I believed in you so much that I wanted you to get all these things done. And so, with her and Christian Kiliani and Sheila Leslie, and um, we, we were able to really make a difference. We were a team. What, what was the most significant thing you got done, do you think? The crystal darkness, because the crystal darkness, uh, I, there were a lot of people that worked on that. I had uh, looked at about the youth and uh, it was 17.9% of uh, high school students in the 11th grade had indicated that they had tried meth once. To me, that was a tragedy. So I was working with some people um, and they were starting to do some films and, and they asked me and Jim to be in it, which we were, but I ended up kind of leading them on because I had connections with you know, Washington, with, with the governors and their wives. So we, we went with Crystal Darkness and not only took it statewide, and this was like almost everybody in the state of Nevada came in and helped. It was not me. It was the people, Las Vegas, everywhere. They would come in and say, we're, we're with you. We're going to get this done. And so it was easy. And then um, we went statewide because, you know, I got to know a lot of the uh, governor's wives. And then we went nationwide, Mexico and China. So it was very, very uh, good plan. And it was really because the citizens of the state of Nevada did a lot of this. They lo did a lot of it. I was just kind of like. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about the. Program okay, itself. the program was we would uh, put together, um, you know, uh, law enforcement people, maybe a governor and spouse. Um, we would put together people that had been on meth for many years, what happens to them. And we made each state have a different one that applied to them. And uh, within nine months, uh, the it was in the newspaper because they followed it. Six percent of the kids in 11th grade 
had taken meth. That was a big difference from 17 to 6 percent. So um, we actually um, probably caused the problem for what drugs they have now because it got so expensive to get meth. We got it all out of all these CVS stores where they, you know, you had to write for a prescription to get it. So um, unfortunately, it just went, you know, people were taking other drugs outside of meth because meth is very expensive now. So, Don, tell us about the, uh, when you first moved into the governor's mansion. Okay. Well, that was in January 2007. I walked in and I realized <laughs> that this was going to be uh, really interesting because at the time they didn't have any heat on. <laughs> and most of the furniture was uh, very, like, really cheap. <laughs> There was no art, none, except for one piece that the list had um, left. And so I had my work cut out for me. Um, I had to hire somebody, you know, to be um, head of the mansion. And, and this was a lady, she was 82 years old. She had worked for the uh, Millers. That was she, Helen. Helen, Miss Helen. And she worked for the Gwens, and then she worked for us. Uh -huh. She was pretty amazing. Uh -huh. One of the th things that was lacking in the governor's mansion, and there was a lot lacking, <laughs> because what, uh, I'll start off coming in, and um, we didn't have heat. Uh, and then later on, when summer came, we didn't have air conditioning. It was always going off. And <clears throat> the upward... Um, uh, one of the places that people could uh, go in and if they were spending the night or whatever, um, <laughs> the water wouldn't work in the bathtub. <laughs> so I kept my luggage in, in the shower. <laughs> and, um, it, it, was, it was kind of almost frightening. So it wasn't easy for us to move in the mansion because we were more comfortable in our home. So we took our time. <laughs> But one of the things I wanted to do is there were no, there was no art mm -hmm. in the mansion, mm -hmm. except for Bob and Liz mm -hmm. and his wife had put one in. So uh, I put it in the foundation and uh, had other people run the foundation. But what we did is buy art, Nevada art. And um, so that was one of the things that I was pleased about because that, that will go forever. Furniture can come and go, but art can last forever. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any particular piece of art that you bought? Yeah, the the most the best one I uh, bought was the one in Lamoille, Nevada, and it was gorgeous. And uh, uh, actually, that's where Jim Gibbons moved <laughs> <laughs> after our divorce. So, um, it, and then, oh, there were. There were just some lovely pieces, you know, and, and Nevadans got credit. And a lot of times, uh, w I had one guy come over and give me some art, too. I, I read about that. You met him on the airplane or something? Yes, yeah. The grandfather clock was there, except the clock didn't work. Oh. And uh, it was kind of spooky because we would get up in the morning and we would see these Hershey Kisses. Seriously. And I'm like, Jim, are you like trying to tell me something? Are you trying to spook me out? And he said, no, I don't know where it is, okay? <laughs> I don't know where they're coming from. But they were Hershey Kisses. And they were outside of this beautiful uh, clock. And so I, I decided I wanted to get, and I felt like it was kind of a spooky clock, and there was not much information about it at the time. So I found somebody that uh, would repair it, and actually they repaired it so well that I think the ghosts left. <laughs> but I've heard stories from uh, kids that uh, back to Callahan and, and uh, you know, some of, some of those telling stories, like one of, of the kids had put a snake in it and scared somebody. And it, it's just, it was funny. 
I did think that the mansion was kind of spooky, and I remember um, Sandy Miller telling me something that had happened to her brother. Well, um, twice uh, Jim uh, woke up in the middle of the night, and um, he felt something breathe on his cheek, and I'm like, okay, he's, he's making this up, okay? But then it happened again, and I could tell he was scared. My son comes over with a bunch of friends because at that time he was at the Merch Marine Academy. And uh, I said, you know, they said, we've heard that it's haunted here. And I said, well, I don't know, but uh, Sandy Miller told me that her brother saw something up in the attic and got really scared. My son goes in and he marches like he's just a big person. Oh, I'm not scared. Fell down. He felt somebody push him down. Oh, that's wild. I know. <laughs> wow. But I told my son, when I died, I didn't get to stay at the mansion the whole time, okay? I was put in the back of the bus, <laughs> so to speak, uh, once our divorce started. And I said, so when I die, you might want to take my ashes and splatter some in the at the mansion. <laughs> So, so let's uh, segue into um, the kind of balancing your family's needs with the governor's mansion needs mm -hmm. and the, you know, the state and all that kind yeah. of stuff. What, what do you think you accomplished? When I was uh, in the legislature, uh, of course, uh, I um, was very happy to work with uh, Frank Casuto Papa on the organ donor program, and that was because of my dad. Uh, and uh, we donated many years ago for that. Uh, the other thing was suicide prevention. So Sheila Leslie, uh, I worked with her when she was uh, head of uh, Children's Cabinet, and I was the chairman. And she, she said, Dawn, I'm going to lose my suicide prevention bill. I said, what do you mean? She says, the Republicans in the Assembly aren't voting for it. They already passed it in the Senate and it was come back. You have to talk to your Republican colleagues. I said, okay. So we had sessions before the legislature, you know, we went down uh, in, in the big room. And uh, I talked to my Republican colleagues, and they weren't going to move. When I came out of my caucus with the Republicans, uh, I had to go by Sheila Leslie's um, desk, and uh, we were ready. Uh, we were going to get that bill passed. And she says, well, did, did you get them to vote? And I said, no, they weren't voting. And she says, damn it, you need to get up and tell your story about your dad. I had never told anybody about my dad. She to Leslie knew, my husband knew, that's it. Never talked about it, because I knew people would judge you if your family member, you know, killed themselves. So I sit and I get up and here comes Sheila Leslie talking about the bill and uh, then some other people came in and none of the Republicans had spoken about the bill. So I pushed the button. I don't even know how I did it. I just, it just automatically went. I stood up and I told a story about my dad and how he had killed himself. And, and I thought, I ended it with, I think if this, uh, this, um, this bill, uh, uh, getting money to help people and, and keep them from uh, suicide, I think that would have helped my dad so much. And I think he would have been proud to have been sitting next to me today, knowing that I was a state legislator. And then I sat down. Joe Dean, he took the uh, gavel and he threw it down on the uh, desk and he said, call for the vote. I mean, <laughs> it was loud. And so everyone voted for it. Wonderful. What an achievement. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you were in the governor's mansion, what do you think was your most significant achievement. Okay. Well, 
I'm going to go back to the legislature because uh, the, the legislature, my greatest achievement was the organ donation. And can, we continue to do that now, today. Frankie, Sue, and I are a team forever. When I uh, was in um, the governor's mansion, I uh, did the Crystal Darkness campaign, which was very important at the time, and, and still is. Uh, I did autism. I started Grant a Gift uh, with Linda Tache. Her son uh, had autism, and, and I was very, very involved in the early times because uh, I did uh, TV programs on it for NBC, uh, and it, it was it was amazing how many people didn't know about autism. And of course now we know a lot more and how we can help them, you know, in the early stages. So that was probably one of the best things. I um, was involved in a lot of uh, vaccinations at that time because people weren't getting certain vaccinations. Reminds me of today. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, um, uh, we needed some of our children that uh, were not able to access vaccinations, so we went all over the state getting vaccinations. I, I followed my colleague, uh, um, Dee McGuinn. She had st started, well, actually, it was Barbara Vukanovich that started the Mamavan, and then John Anson got involved in it, and then Dima. Uh, took it over when that was when she was first lady so in honor of her I kept it going and it, it, you know it's it's been a beautiful relationship and friendship with her because we you know we were supporting each other but um, I, I did a lot of things and sometimes I look at it and think how did I do all that but I knew that I was only going to be there for either four years or eight years and I knew I could make a difference uh, by getting other people involved and then letting them take over. That's, that's <laughs> I'm good at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm like, okay, I put the people together. Now you do it. Yeah. And then I'm going over here and I'm going to do this. <laughs> so um, it wasn't really me. It was other people. But you were the organizer. Yeah, just the organizer. Well, I'm important. good at that. <laughs> I'm good at giving instructions. <laughs> But we, we do get a lot done, and, uh, and I thank, you know, my colleagues in the legislature uh, because they supported me as first lady, they, they made sure I had the funds to get things done and to travel back and forth from Las Vegas to uh, northern Nevada, so I was, I was in an airplane all the time. How did you manage to balance all this? In the governor's mansion, I, I had to balance being a mother and a wife, and uh, really my, my biggest uh, work was to help the people of Nevada that needed the help. And I knew that I could be effective in that way. So um, we, we really um, worked and did a lot of good things, and uh, again, I give uh, full credit to the people of Nevada because a lot of times I would start something and then they would carry on. And I can, T tell you probably some I can't even think of how many things we did because we did so much. <laughs> um, ovarian cancer, positively kids. Yes. Oh yeah. Can you See, I can't those? even remember all this <laughs> that I did, but um, uh, positively kids was great. Uh, children, uh, children's cabinet. You know, we did so much uh, with the children's cabinet, and then. I was able to be helpful because I was the first lady. And, um, and even when we were going through the divorce, uh, people um, recognized that I, I was doing good work, so they didn't really care. They didn't seem to care. And then at some point, I didn't really care because I knew I was doing good stuff and, okay, if my husband's gonna divorce me, uh, I mean, he had three women at one time. I'm thinking, if, if those women were my friends, I thought they befriended me, but um, if he hadn't had, if I hadn't had any friends, he probably wouldn't have had anybody today. So maybe it's my fault. <laughs> I don't think so.
Well, tell us, it, was, it seems like it was really awkward when you had to kind of move into a different part of the mansion. Yes, yeah. So uh, the judge we had, uh, I felt like she was kind of favoring the governor <laughs> because when we would go to court, he would wear sunglasses and, you know, that's just not appropriate. Um, a lot of times she, uh, I would say something and she said, oh, you know, you're not able to talk. She uh, made a decision. She told Jim, if you want, I can put Dawn back into the house and, uh, or I can keep her in the other place of the mansion, which is the back of the bus. <laughs> That's what I called it, the back of the bus. And um, he says, well, he says, uh, let me think about it. She says, well, you have till tomorrow. That's what the judge said. So the next day, he said, no, just put her in the back of, back of the bus. So tell us what that really meant. You had to pack up and... Yeah, I had to pack up and move into this little apartment. And, uh, and that's where I, I lived until our divorce was over. And were you able to work from there and get things yeah. done? Like you yeah, did I did. I, I, I mean, I had all these women supporting me. And they'd say, Don't, you keep doing what you're doing. We like what you're doing. We want you to do that. And you just stay there. And, and one of them was uh, um, the guy, that, the Venetian, his wife. She's the one, don't you leave that mansion. You're doing something good and you keep doing it. So I did. And I just decided I wasn't going to worry about the divorce. I was Dawn Gibbons. I was a business person. I was a legislator. And I can help get things done. Not by myself, okay? Again, it was the citizens of Nevada. When I look back at being in the governor's mansion, I realized it didn't matter if I was inside the mansion because I could go on the down floor because we had kids come in every day and I wanted to share the mansion with them. So, and that's why Miss uh, Helen Weiner was so good because if I couldn't be there, she still kept the kids coming in all day long because we wanted them to realize that's their home too. It belongs to the citizens of the state. But um, I, I just realized that being in this little apartment, uh, I'm working with all the criminals. <laughs> Some of them. Um, Are you talking about the prison inmates? The prison, in, prison inmates. Okay. And uh, I got to know them very well. Although one time <laughs> they actually took my underwear <laughs> folded everything, and I got kind of embarrassed. <laughs> so I said, please don't do that ever again. But um, I, I still t stay in touch with the ones because they could not take my uh, telephone number because I said, if, if they took anything back to the prison, they went through their shoes, everything. So I said, you have to remember my number. And so I would keep telling them every day. And I heard from them all the time. I still hear from them. And they've done really well. They have done very well. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, I just decided that I was going to do what I needed to do and um, and get you know help people while I could. Okay, because I knew it wasn't going to last long because the guy was divorcing me. Yeah. <laughs> so I better get as much done as I could. Yeah. And so. Anything else about the governor's mansion that you want to talk about? This is the one thing I loved about the governor's mansion, and it kind of hurt when uh, the divorce started coming in. But I loved doing the Halloween. I started the first year doing the Easter eggs, and it, you know had our name like, and the White House does that. So I had all the kids come. And we did the Easter Bunny, and they all got an Easter egg, uh, you know, with the governor's name and, and, and the first lady's name. And then the next year, I was able to still do it. Uh, and then from the second year on, I didn't get to do the Halloween, and I really loved to do that. So, and Christmas, I brought all my Christmas stuff from my house because they didn't have hardly anything there. To decorate so and then some people loaned me some things and, and we decorated it really big because I loved Christmas 
And uh, I did something on Valentine's. Every, everything, I decorated it outside. Even though we were getting through a divorce, I wanted to make it pretty nice for, for the people. Don, tell us about your careers after the Governor's Mansion. Very okay. briefly, what you did. Okay. Um, there was an after time of the Governor's Mansion, and uh, I was ready for it. I had already a job. Uh, I had Fox News. I was uh, had my own radio show, and Jim Rogers, uh, he hired me as the senior vice president of communication, and government relations, and we also did uh, a talk show together. And it was called Dawn and Jim, and people thought that was so funny. But I had I look back and I think, hmm. I wished I'd had like Bonnie Bryan, you know, she, she loved being in the mansion. She had a great time. It was the best time in her life. Dima felt that way. Sandy Miller felt that way. And I just didn't have that. I didn't have that. But, but you moved on. But I moved on. We did some great things and collaborating with a, a lot of people in the state of Nevada and uh, we made a difference. Tell us about your job now. So now I work for the state. Um, I, I did work for Jim Rogers, but he died, and after he died, then um, I did some other things at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, but then I got this job uh, with the Nevada Transportation Authority, and um, I didn't know anything about transportation. <laughs> And I told the governor that, and he says, yeah, but you know business, so that's why I'm putting you in here. This was Governor Sandoval. Yeah, and he said, I need you to clean up Reno, and it had had a lot of problems there. You know, there was somebody that, you know, was on drugs, that, um, you know, got in a horrible wreck, and it, it was just, it was a mess. So when I walked into this Nevada Transportation Authority, there, um, there was not a door. Um, well, it was the backside of a door. It was just wood, never been painted. I moved some of these um, big uh, containers that have files in them, and I said, no, we're going to put them in the cloud. <laughs> and every time I moved one over, I realized I had to paint because they only painted around <laughs> <laughs> the thing. So, um, so I got it cleaned up and then I uh, finally got us in a better place uh, across from the airport and I've been very happy there. You work with a lot of different people, mm -hmm. different I, agencies? Yes. And, um, it, it, you know, I, I'm not an attorney, but I went to uh, the National Council, I mean National Judicial College and uh, took administrative uh, law judge uh, program and you know I guess being a legislator helped but um, it, it's like I'm always learning because there are all so many new things and we're talking statutes that are huge <laughs> and uh, so I, I feel really blessed and then um, Governor Sislak has been really good to me and so has his wife. I'm very thankful for that and I think they appreciate me. You, you, you're using all of your life experience, uh, especially your ability to get along with a lot of different people mm -hmm. and get them to work together. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We, um, we have a good team now and uh, I, I'm the kind of person I want to know if you've got a problem. So when I go into work every day, I go and talk to every single person. And, um, and it, it's been good. I think, you know, sometimes I think being a woman is a little, still a little hard because when you're the chair, you know, everybody wants to be the chair, okay? <laughs> well, uh, I have to make them feel important and just as important as anybody else. And that's worked well for me. So what advice would you give from your life experience to a young woman just getting started in the world? My advice to young women is don't be afraid. Don't let anybody get in front. You keep moving forward. Because women are used to 
taken care. They make um, they break they make the broken. They take the bacon and put it on the plate, and oftentimes they're cleaning it up as well, and keeping a full time job. So I say women can do anything. I have a son, I tell him, you know women can do anything? And he says, yeah, mom, I have a, a, a pilot who's a woman and she is fl flying the F-35. And I almost cried when I got to meet her because she was so amazing. I thought, when I was growing up, there's no way, if I wanted to be a pilot, they'd say, no, because you have to pee in a bag, okay? <laughs> They figured it out for a woman, all right? And she's amazing. And I love that my son thinks she's amazing. Tell us about getting along with other people and how that's made a difference in your life. I, I think the biggest difference that has happened to me is having people, for instance, I was in the legislature, two sides of the aisle, but we came together. And, and then it was very effective because you have to, okay, on this side, there's Democrats, this side, Republicans, or vice versa. And, and, and we get the good and we work it out. And to me, those uh, type of relationships, collaborating together is, is very, makes people successful. And especially people that are servants, public servants that are, you know, in powerful positions, but we expect that they somehow come in the middle and get things done. You know, the far right, that, that can be a problem, the far left can be a problem, but we have to think about where are the group of citizens that need good jobs, that need a helping hand at the end of their own arm. Maybe, sometimes they might need a helping hand from someone else. So I, I think that it's m the most important thing right now is getting back to that because right now people are not working together and we need them to work together. So that's my feelings for these people <laughs> that are in office. Okay, put your ego aside and do what you really believe is right because we have a lot of problems here and we need to get them straightened out. Everything that I've done and done well is because it was a collaboration of other people that wanted to do great things as well. So uh, I think that is the best thing that I can tell even young women or young men that don't make it about you. If you make it about others, you will be successful and you really and truly want to do a good job and help people, you have no problems in life. It's just when people get greedy. So don't get greedy. Everybody's got a place at the table. And when you have everybody that feels like they're just as important, good things will happen. And you know what? At 67 years old, I look back and I think, wow, what things could I have done if I had been born years later? But I'm so grateful to see men and women who now, um, the young people are, they're very transparent. They, uh, they want to tell the truth and, and they want to be, they, they don't want to work as hard because they also want to live a life that's fruitful and, and, and good. So I think that's a, a good balance. I, I didn't do that. All I did was work all my life. That's, you know, going, Going from everything I went through, I knew I had to depend on myself. And that probably wasn't the best thing for Dawn Gibbons. I probably needed to take some time off and enjoy life a little more. But um, I can't help who I am. So in your life, uh, good things have come out of some of the bad experiences. When I think back on all the bad experiences with my mom leaving, my dad committing suicide, my my husband uh, divorcing me when he was governor. It was so embarrassing and so awful for me. But I, I look back and I think, you know, I, I grew to be stronger. I don't let anything, you know, get past me. I, 
I, I take things on and, and do my very best. And I started to love myself. And that was important. And other people. And other people. Yeah. I have a lot of friends. And that has been my survival, is having friends that care about you, that want to support you, and I want to support them. And, and that's made a big difference in my life. Don Gibbons is a big success. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I think I am. I, I, I do think I am. If, if you look back on everything I went through, people go, oh. But I, I think I pulled through, and I, I'm happy with my life. Thank you, Don, for a wonderful interview. I really enjoyed meeting you. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed meeting you. But when I found out you were in the newspaper business, scared me to death when I first sat down here. But you've been lovely. Thank you.